Thanks. Thanks especially to the Center for Advanced Study, Millercom Lecture Committee, to the College of Fine and Applied Arts, Laredo Taft Lecture Committee, the Department of Theater, the Department of English, the Campus Honors Program, and the Cranert Center for the Performing Arts, and also the Station Theater and the Institute for Labor and Industrial Relations for their support of this event. Christopher Bigsby is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and Professor of American Studies at the University of East Anglia and Director of the Arthur Miller Center. Bigsby is the author of more than 30 books on aspects of American drama and culture, notably the three-volume Critical Introduction to 20th Century uh, Drama, Contemporary American Playwrights, and individual volumes on modern American playwrights, most notably on the late Arthur Miller. Along with Don Wilmoth, Bigsby edited the Cambridge History of American Theater, which was the winner of the Bernard Hewitt Award for Outstanding Research in Theater History, which was named after University of Illinois Department of Theater Chair Bernard Hewitt. Chris Bigsby's breadth and depth of knowledge of modern American playwrights and his perspective on the American theater and culture make him ideal to speak about Tennessee Williams' early career. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Bigsby in his presentation on Tennessee Williams' Radical of the Heart. Something very strange about an English person coming to Champaign-Urbana to talk about Tennessee Williams, but um, there are stranger things. I once was um, sent by the British Council to India um, to talk about the glories of British culture. <laughs> and uh, my host threw a party and took me up onto the roof and he pointed across the street and he said, do you see the tree across the road? And I said, yes. He said, the British hanged my grandfather from that tree. <laughs> now being British, I knew what to say. I, I said, um, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> and he said, oh no, it is things like this that bring us together. Of course, it's things like that that have brought the British together with much of the world, uh, <laughs> including this particular part of the world. But anyhow, Tennessee Williams. We all know Tennessee Williams, do we not? Not least because we've seen his work parodied by The Simpsons. <laughs> he was a Southern writer drawn to the Gothic, whose plays were laced through with violence and sexuality, and who wrote about fading Southern bells and menaced artists, a man who seemed to come out of nowhere in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War and had burned himself out by 1960 on the verge of what he himself and for good reasons called his stoned decade, a writer whose life seemed not only to have no second act but which seemed to have no prologue. Well, the fact is that some of his late plays are well worth more attention than they receive, while as you all know, because of the work that's been done here, there were 10 years of plays before The Glass Menagerie. He's a 30s writer's in, writer in origin. Tennessee Williams, of course, was an odd name that caused him uh, a number of problems. Uh, though, of course, it, as you well know, it was not his own, that being Tom, unsurprisingly, the name of the character in The Glass Menagerie based on him. Tennessee, well, there was a Tennessee connection with the family, but it was also the name given to him by his fellow students at Iowa, for whom one Southerner was much like another. One Boston reviewer commenting on Battle of Angels, which was his disastrous debut in the professional theater, misled by his name, thought it had been written by a hillbilly. While Dorothy Parker said that if he was gonna call himself Tennessee, she would call herself Palestine. His name then seems a bit odd until you recall that his father's name was Coffin and that his great-great-great-grandfather's name was Preserved Fish Dakin. <laughs> Dinner time must have been very good, especially if they were serving preserved fish. So born and raised not in, not in Tennessee but Mississippi, Williams moved with his family to Missouri, 
where for two years he studied at the University of Missouri and then for a further year at Washington University, St. Louis, a city which he particularly hated. And it was while there that he wrote Candles to the Sun. When Williams left St. Louis, it was to go to Iowa, not, you might think, a natural home for a man who at 21 had voted for the socialist candidate for president. Socialists in this country, in my experience, being placed on a par with child molesters. <laughs> Certainly when I first went to, uh, to Iowa a few decades ago, I lectured at a college which had just voted on whether or not to allow mixed dancing. It passed on the faculty vote. Uh, although I have to say, when you discover that the Puritan name for mixed dancing was gynecandrical dancing, you'll see why they were against it. <laughs> but as it happens, Iowa, Iowa does have a radical tradition and an admittedly somewhat tenuous connection with theater. In 1848, Davenport, Iowa, attracted a young man uh, like Tennessee's great-grandfather fleeing from Germany. In his case, he was a German radical escaping from revolutions in Europe. His name was Heinz, and to this day, you eat his beans. But Davenport also bred two people who would help found the modern American theater, Jig Cook and Susan Glaspell, who together created the Provincetown Players, discoverers of Eugene O'Neill, who in his fascination with pipe dreams in The Iceman Cometh would not be far from Tennessee Williams' characters who embrace illusions as a necessary tactic of survival. There are no lies, he once remarked, and I quoted this the other day, but those thrust down the throat by the hard-knuckled hand of need. We have a tendency to read lives backwards, to forget that the old were once young. Our parents are eternally middle-aged at best, and we forget that everyone faces the world anew, that those parents once burned with the same passions of youth and also had to invent themselves day by day. And there's a temptation to read Tennessee Williams' life backwards, beginning with a solitary death in a hotel room, close kin to Eugene O'Neill, who was born and who died in the same anonymous surroundings. O'Neill was said to have said, born in a hotel room, and God damn it, died in a hotel room. Uh, Tennessee uh, Williams died choking to death on the plastic cap of his medication with a wine bottle beside him. There's a temptation then to read him through, not just that, but the disregard with which America has so often treated its writers particularly perhaps its playwrights, as attention shifts to other writers, other subjects, other concerns, as fashion or America's inordinate respect for European culture blinds it to the qualities of its own. But this is also a good moment to recall the young Tennessee Williams, a man somewhat bewildered in himself, but sure of one thing, that he would be a writer. The question was, what kind of a writer? How far was this man, who began writing in the most radical decade of the 20th century, more so even than the 1960s, because more was at stake for more people in the 30s, how far was he himself a radical? It's been said that it was easier to join the Communist Party than a fraternity at an American university in the 1930s. Leo Marx, a leading figure in American studies in this country, confessed to being radicalized by his teacher at Harvard, while in 1935, Charles Walgreen withdrew his niece from the University of Chicago on the grounds that faculty had inculcated students with ideas of communism and free love. So remember next, that next time you shop at Walgreens because that's the Walgreen it was. And it's a reminder, actually, that people like Macy and Filene, these were real people. You think of them as department stores. They were real people. It was um, something of an exaggeration, but campuses were a center for radicalism. Though whether the University of Missouri or Washington University were, was another matter. Tom Williams was never tempted to join the party. He did join 
a fraternity. I feel like saying that again because it's so unbelievable. He did join a fraternity. Though anyone less attuned to animal house existence would be hard to, to find. Um, there is so much. I'm a professor of American studies. I'm supposed to know something about America. But you baffle me almost completely for much of the time, I have to say. Uh, what on earth are fraternities and sororities about? And what on earth are cheerleaders for? Uh, I mean, young women take many of their clothes off, jump up and down in front of thousands of people, and try and date people whose IQs are in single digits. Uh, I'm sorry, this has nothing to do with Tennessee Women's Book. Will someone explain to me why, outside small towns in the Midwest, there will be a sign which will tell you the population and the height above sea level? <laughs> Is there a connection between the... <laughs> the sea is 1,500 miles away. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Tennessee Williams did register the radical spirit that was at large in the 1930s. And the plays he wrote at the University of Missouri, at Washington University, then at Iowa, reflected this, as did his early story, Big Black, a Mississippi Idol, which featured a black man on a chain gang and his imagined relationship with a white woman, hardly in line with views either in Mississippi or St. Louis at the time. And it's interesting to note Williams' interest in race at this time. He was, after all, a Southern writer. Apropos of nothing, well, not quite apropos of nothing. At this same moment, Arthur Miller was writing a novel never published, inspired by Native Son, which was an outright attack on American racism. He wrote this in the 1930s, 1940. Never, never came out, never published. But that was an issue at the moment. How deep did Tennessee Williams' radicalism go? Well, I suppose not very, at least not at first. Um, but as Arthur Miller would say of him, there is such a thing as a radicalism of the soul. Williams' own self-image was as a radical of sorts, though at first he kept his distance. In June 1936, as we learned just uh, now, about an hour ago, he attended the Midwest Writers' Conference in Chicago and noted, this is a quotation, as might be expected, the conference seemed more concerned with politics than literature and was so extraordinarily dull that I left immediately after the morning session and didn't return. All this hullabaloo about fascist repression seems like so much shadow boxing to me at the present time. The fiercest of our revolutionary writers are now receiving monthly checks of well over $1,000 from the government for activities which they themselves describe as mostly boondoggling. So I cannot feel that the fascist peril is very imminent at this moment. Well, that's him in June 1936. The boondoggling was the federal theater that in truth he did his best to join and he was wrong about the $1,000, it was closer to 100. He was also wrong about the fascist peril. One month later, July the 17th, 1936, came the Spanish Civil War, which radicalized a generation, or at least a part of a generation. It's, it's very easy to talk about the 30s as though all, all Americans joined the Communist Party. You know, most Americans didn't go anywhere near the Communist Party. We're talking about uh, a particular group of intellectuals and uh, people at universities and so on. It, it was not widespread. Nonetheless, it had a significant cultural impact. In November 1936, he confessed to having, as he said, a natural uncongeniality for professional againsters. On the other hand, it was now from 1935 to 7 that he wrote Candles to the Sun, which he described as a bad play, feverish, coarse, juvenile, and talky. <laughs> Do come along and see it. Uh, <laughs> this was the later Tennessee Williams wishing to distance himself from the work that he'd done earlier. Someone was asking, 
Why did these plays not come out? Why weren't they published? Williams himself was distancing himself from plays that didn't fit his new sense of who he was. Well, that play, Candles to the Sun, if you haven't seen it, is a play in which young men are sacrificed to the interests of mine owners. And it has all the elements of a 1930s protest play with its red Christ prepared to sacrifice, sacrifice himself for others and its Mary Magdalene. Williams had been raised in a religious, though not a Catholic, family. In Candles to the Sun, the interests of the family have to be substituted for the interests of the group, a theme that would be echoed in much 30s writing and certainly in John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Remember, Ma Jode says, used to be the family was fast, ain't so no more, now it's everybody. Echoed too in the title of um, Arthur Miller's All My Sons, everybody is your son, it's not the family. The family becomes a conservative force, as of course it was in, in Marxist terms. Remember, even Ernest Hemingway, of all people, would end his novel, uh, to have and have not, with the words, a man alone ain't got no bloody fucking chance. The penultimate word being replaced with an asterisk so as not to offend American readers who, after all, we know, never use such language. <laughs> this was the same Hemingway who wrote For Whom the Bell Tolls with its Christ figure laying down his life to save the group as a woman called Maria looks on and he presses his back against the wood of the tree or the cross. In 1937, Williams submitted Candles to the Sun to the Dramatist Guild. And there were readers' reports, which you can read in the archives. One reader said, there is a heartbreaking sincerity about this play that in large part compensates for its glaring faults in construction and continuity. Do come. <laughs> He complained that the author appeared to show little knowledge of dramatic technique. Another reader recommended its rejection, oddly saying that when the strike at its center is over, all is bliss in Alabama. Now, for those who have seen it, to say the least, this is somewhat far from the mark. Just as in the sea, there are counter currents moving in the opposite direction to those on the surface, so there are in candles to the sun. The play does not conclude with a satisfactory end to the strike, which is at the heart of the play. It ends with Star, one of the char women characters, on her way to a life of prostitution, with Luke, a young man whose life is illuminated by a love of reading, now plunged into a darkness with no real glimmer of light, arguably betrayed by his reading that has led him to a politics at odds with his sensibility. It has not liberated him, but trapped him, trapped his mind, his body, his spirit. They're all constricted. The play ends with Fern, another woman character, waiting for three blasts on the siren, which will signify the realization of her fears and the closing of a terrible circle as she loses the last person who matters to her. Beneath the conventionalities of a strike play is another play entirely, a play about frustrated desire, about a fear of death, about the absurdity of a life which serves nothing but its temporary continuance. It's a play in which the visionaries are destroyed, in which it is the women who have a tensile strength, doomed though they are, to see those visions destroyed by a seemingly implacable material power. Like Samuel Beckett's characters, Williams's were born astride the grave, and they are in this play. All is not well, not bliss, in Alabama. A third referee said of it that it was a terribly sincere story reeking of loose writing and an effort to stir up emotions by cheap theatrical tricks. Nonetheless, he thought the characters well drawn and some of the scenes to be fine, he recommended a rewrite. 
1937, Williams actually appeared as an actor, and this takes some believing, performing the role of a black chairman of a church convention in a play protesting the appointment to the Supreme Court of the ill-named Senator Hugo Black of Alabama, a play written by a black author. It wouldn't be the last time he acted. Many decades later, Tennessee Williams appeared in a production of his own play, Small Craft Warning, in which he played the part of a doctor stripped of his license to practice, a patent reflection of his own sense of being a writer no longer respected in America, no longer licensed to write. At the same time, back in 1937, he was planning a play to be called The Holy Family, inspired by the life of Van Gogh, as we call him, Van Gogh, as you would call him, who, he explained, took a prostitute to live with him, who soon gave birth to an illegitimate child by another man. Gauguin had responded by saying, ah, the holy family, maniac, prostitute, and bastard. <laughs> Does that, Williams queried in a letter, sound too profane? <laughs> well, yes, and he seems to have decided not to write that play. In 1937, the situation in Spain that, as I said, activated the radicalism of a generation, finally seemed to strike home to Tennessee Williams. He wrote in his journal, my life is entirely too internal. I need action on the outside, in the world. Tonight, I would gladly enlist in the loyalist army in Spain and might even relish the sounds of an aerial bombardment. It was a piece of rhetoric, plainly unattached to that kind of commitment that would lead Arthur Miller to consider going to Spain. And Miller, it has to be said, did not consider for very long and later expressed gratitude that his mother had been fiercely against him going. Uh, not least because his friend who did go and Arthur took him to the boat died in Spain. And that news came back to the University of Michigan and it was a shock to Miller and, and all his fellow undergraduates. Yet a year later, Tennessee seemed more forthright about his apparent radicalism, writing a piece to accompany, as we heard just now, for those who were here, uh, a production of Sinclair Lewis's play, It Can't Happen Here, which was a favorite play of the Federal Theater, which opened it in 26 cities simultaneously across America and which considered the possibility of fascism taking root here in the United States. In his journal, Williams wrote, I am at last becoming sincerely aroused in my social conscience. I begin to appreciate the very real dangers of fascism. The program note which he wrote observed that and he wrote the program note for it can't happen here. Uh, leaders in every field of science and art have fled from the black-shirted countries. Without such men, there would be no progress in civilization. Culture would become merely a product of the munitions, uh, munitions factories. Most of these great exiles came to America because they thought America was free from fascism. Is it possible that they were mistaken in that belief? Can fascism come to this country. And as Lyle Leverich points out, in St. Louis with its German-American population, that was not entirely a rhetorical question. The German-American Bund was quite a powerful force for some time. And Father Coughlin, who borrowed his speeches from Goebbels and was a very popular radio broadcaster, uh, was an influential force. So was Williams a radical? fired by a vision of a transformed America. In Death is a Drummer, later called Me Vasha, he attacked an arms manufacturer, a man he described as having the smile of Il Duce, Mussolini. In Stairs to the Roof, set in 1934, a time as a character remarks when one out of 10 guys in our class has got the barest possibility of finding any kind of job, and which he described as a prayer for the wild of heart that are kept in cages. A character remarks, people wouldn't be killing and trying to conquer each other 
unless there was something terribly, terribly wrong at the bottom of things. It just occurs to me that maybe the wrong thing is this, this regimentation, this gradual grinding out of the lives of the little people under the thumbs of things that are bigger than they are. And what are we to make of Candles to the Sun, written between 1935 and 7, in the middle of a radical decade, with radical plays being staged around the country? 1935, remember, was the year of Clifford Odets's Waiting for Lefty, a strike play which had New York audiences on their feet shouting out the words strike and marching out of the theatre as they supposed to change the world, certainly to change America. And I, I know a man who was in that audience and they did indeed do that. I don't know how far they got outside the theatre um, before their enthusiasm for this began to falter. Meanwhile, up in Michigan, a young Arthur Miller wrote a strike play in 1935, called No Villain, and visited a mine. Candles to the Sun is set in a mine. The mine he visited was in North Carolina, and it was a talc mine, something I didn't even know existed. I never asked myself where talcum came from, um, but it was mined, and there was a strike there, and the same conditions that are pictured by Tennessee Williams existed there, and Miller was as indignant. In 1938, Williams wrote a play which saw prison as an expression of capitalism and in which a prisoner is driven mad. That's Arthur Miller wrote that. In the same year, Tennessee Williams wrote Not About Nightingales, a play which saw prison as an expression of capitalism and in which one prisoner is driven mad. These two writers who were going to suddenly appear on the scene after the war were moving in parallel, writing the same plays, both writing strike plays, both writing prison plays. Except that Miller was a Marxist and a committed Marxist and stayed such until 1949-50 and paid the price because uh, a lot of criticism of Miller plays was, came from, not from the right, there was plenty of that, but from the left. The four former communists who moved to Trotskyism and who vilified Miller. Uh, Williams was never a Marxist. Candles to the Sun certainly seemed to conform to a familiar 1930s pattern with young men destroyed by capitalism and a gallant radical sacrificing himself for others, thus teaching of the necessity for mutual support. As late as 1940, Williams wrote a letter in which he recounted a conversation which had impressed him, in which it had been explained to him that while fascism was malignant and capitalism based on exploitation, communism represented the only true way out. As he wrote, what are we to do about it? In 1949, in an essay in which he recalled his time with the Mummers theatrical troupe which produced this play, the radical St. Louis theater group, he said, today we are living in a world threatened by totalitarianism. The fascist and communist states have thrown us into a panic of reaction Reactionary opinion descends like a ton of bricks on the head of any artist who speaks out against the current of prescribed ideas. We are all under wraps of one kind or another, trembling before the spectre of investigating committees. And even with Buchenwald in the backs of our minds, when we consider whether or not we dare say we were for Henry Wallace, yes, he says, it is as bad as that. That's Tennessee Williams. Henry Wallace, incidentally, was the communist-backed third-party candidate for the presidency in 1948. Well, no, it wasn't as bad as that. And the reference to Buchenwald seems to come out of nowhere. But here is Tennessee Williams, a man who would write to the State Department protesting the withholding of a passport from Arthur Miller, who did vote for Henry Wallace, and who seemingly resisted the repressive nature of American society. In truth, though, for the most part, I suspect he wrote radical plays because he thought there was a market for radical plays, as he wrote other kinds of plays and stories for the same reason. He wrote a crime play, Curtains for the Gentleman. He wrote a ghost play, The Strangers. Indeed, when Erwin uh, 
how do you pronounce it in America, Piscator or Piscator? I heard it Piscator before. Uh, rewrote Williams' Battle of Angels as an anti-fascist work, Williams withdrew it. Though, in fact, Battle of Angels revealed Williams as a fierce opponent of Southern racism. Some, something still evident when he revised the play as Orpheus Descending, but now a little more muted, a significant black character having been removed between the two versions. Nonetheless, Williams did see himself as offering a continuing critique of America, in a 1950 book review, he wrote, our contemporary society seems no longer inclined to hold itself open to very explicit criticism from within. Something he trusted was a temporary condition, since, as he said, it is directly contrary to the true American nature and tradition. For the moment, though, what he saw was, this quotation, the all but complete suppression of any dissident voices which forced the artist to retreat into the self. Two years later, in 1952, after all, his director and friend, Elia Kazan, would be called before the House Un-American Activities Committee and required to betray other people as the price of citizenship. In that same year, 1952, Williams wrote a brief biographical essay in which he recalled his time in Missouri when he was writing Candles to the Sun, and lived in a, an ugly apartment building which stood in stark contrast to those in which the rich lived. It produced, he said, a shock and a rebellion that has grown into an inherent part of my work. It was the beginning of the social consciousness which I think has marked most of my writing. This person we think of as the writer of Gothic about fading southern bells and all the rest of it. On the other hand, he failed to get onto the WPA Writers Project because he insisted his work was taken as lacking social content and protest. If he wrote protest plays, they didn't protest enough for him to get on the WPA. As late as 1977, in Red Devil Battery Sign, in which he staged America as a society which seemed to have spiraled down into a wasteland, he has a character denounced what is clearly the Vietnam War, then just two years in the past, in the most direct and brutal way. This character speaks of, quote, barefoot little rice paddy and cane field people, innocent-eyed, simple-hearted as water oxen, asking just rice in a hand or a bowl out of a day's or a night's work, set to war with each other in spite of their blood connection religious and cultural connection because, because, you see, the huge secret investment had to be protected by sympathetically corrupt regimes. Oh, fighting Asia's like fighting God and time, but they figure they could do just that. No big hassle, you see, genocide for profits undeclared. Is that the Tennessee Williams you have in your minds? The following year, in 1978, he denounced America's use of nuclear weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, while acknowledging the ineffectualness of that revolt, to which artists, it seemed to him, necessarily commit themselves. No rational grown-up artist, he declared, deludes himself with the notion that his inherent instinctive rejection of the failed ideologies of failed governments or power combines that mask themselves as governments, will in the least divert those monoliths from a fixed course to which the slag heap remnants of once towering cities consigns them. Nonetheless, a function of writers seemed clear to him. They observe, he said, while they can, the confused, the fatally wrong moves of men, not often evil themselves, but forced by vested power interest to give support to evil. The word of an artist, must always remain a word most compatible with the word revolutionary and so be more than a word. But as Arthur Miller wrote in a piece never published, whenever one speaks of an artist being revolutionary, it is best to remember how fearful he had to have been of rejection and sneering incomprehension, a reason for backing away from commitment. Nonetheless, Tennessee Williams' heart did lie elsewhere. 
It lay with the wild at heart in stairs to the roof, the broken poet who dies in Death is the Drummer. As he remarked, the most destructible element in our society, the immature and rootless artists or poet, is the one that is subjected to the worst lambasting, groups of them huddled together for some dim communal comfort. He did believe in those who lived on the margin. He believed in the poet in a prosaic world who's damaged by experience, broken by the failure of love. But that was not primarily because he favored a different politics, but because he celebrated those who chose not to embrace the American century declared by Henry Luce in 1941, a country on the make, in love with money, progress, power, entranced by its own particularity, sick, as Williams said, with neon. Lovely phrase. That, I suspect, is what Miller meant by a radicalism of the soul. To be sure, capitalists, those with power, fascists come off very badly in Williams's plays, but so in another way do poets, musicians, artists, desperate believers in a world transformed by the imagination. They go to their deaths, such people, step into the private world of their glass menagerie, or are left off, led off to the isolating horror of a mental institution on the arm of a stranger. Though my view of the glass menagerie has never quite recovered from discovering that when Williams was writing it, Truman Capote played the role of Laura. <laughs> I'm sorry to have told you that. <laughs> there is clearly a sense in which his hostility to American society was a response to America's hostility towards him. The fact is that he was homosexual in a society whose model was the frontiersman, the cowboy, the marine. Though there would be those like Leslie Fiedler who would detect a homoerotic significance to those quintessential male pairings, Natty Bumpo and Chigook, Huck Finn and Jim, Ishmael and Queequeg, and those buddy movies uh, which were extreme violence to a sentimental male bonding, though perhaps it's best not to say such things in Topeka or perhaps Champagne. The laws against homosexuality as Williams grew up were draconian. In Mississippi, where he lived until the age of 12, the laws against what, against what was called unnatural intercourse with man or beast were not overtoned and, and turned until two years ago, 2003. The reference to intercourse with beasts cast an interesting light on Mississippi. <laughs> he then traveled to Missouri, where again it was 2003 before the laws were finally overthrown. From there he went to Iowa, which until the mid-1970s had a law calling for the sterilization of what were called sexual perverts and moral degenerates. The mid-1970s. Perhaps that's why emasculation crops up so often in Williams's work. It's a secret fear. The sodomy law was repealed in Iowa in 1976, though the Iowa Supreme Court ruled that heterosexual sodomy had the support of the Constitution, which conjures up wonderful images of the conversation presumed to have taken place in Philadelphia in 1776. <laughs> As to Illinois, when it was part of the Northwest Territory, the penalty for homosexuality was death. In 1805, that was liberalized, if that's the word, to five years in prison, a fine, and 500 lashes. Later, it would lead to life imprisonment. In 1901, it was ruled that fellatio was a crime against nature, but that cunnilingus was not. I make no comment. <laughs> You'll be glad to know, however, or perhaps not, depending on how you feel that sodomy in private has not been against the law in this state since 1961. Though there was considerable debate, believe it or not, over the important question of whether bushes could be said to be private. <laughs> Judge Judy, where are you? <laughs> My point, though, is that for much of his life, Williams was legally regarded as a sexual deviant liable to arrest, prosecution, and imprisonment. 
a reason not only for radical disagreement with his society, but also for the affinity that he felt for other writers in the same predicament as himself, prime amongst whom was Hart Crane. Six months ago, I got a telephone call in England from an elderly American who was living there. He asked if I would be interested in a number of letters by Tennessee Williams sent to him in the early 1950s. <laughs> would I? <laughs> uh, <laughs> He had been in the military and was gay. And you will recall that that was a hot issue when Bill Clinton was president. Uh, though it has to be said that it was as well that Clinton wasn't brought up in Illinois with its views on Philatio and etc. In, in, in the very first letter that this man um, was sent to, to him by Williams, Williams says, Crane remains closest to my heart, closer to my heart than any other modern artist. I think he's a sort of archetype of the martyred artist in our times. I must confess his life is more meaningful to me personally than that of Christ, if only because he practiced my vocation in my time and suffered the same damnation that I and possibly you and so many others must suffer. That last remark was coded because Williams was trying to finesse the sexual orientation of his correspondent. He didn't know whether he was gay or not, possibly you. Williams also admired Carson McCullers, he explained, because she had the same tortured sensibility, as he put it. Crane was homosexual. McCullers was lesbian. Crane committed suicide. He made a, an approach to a sailor on a ship, was rebuffed and he jumped overboard and died. Under the pressure of his suppressed feelings, Crane turned to alcohol, as did Williams. Crane was at odds with his businessman father, as was Williams with his, uh, though Crane's father could at least lay claim to having invented a candy. He invented the lifesaver, which is rather ironic. <laughs> Williams' critique of American society then, oh, that's awful, I shouldn't, really shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Forget I said that. Um, Williams' critique of American society then, his celebration of the poet, the man or woman whose sexuality was central to their existence, but disapproved of to the point of persecution, was rooted in his own sensibility. Did that make him a radical? It certainly made him profoundly distrustful of authority, of an oppressive conformity, of a menacing system whose myths and values were so at odds with his own. Then again, he came from the South, and the South had also had to learn to live with defeat, like Williams deflecting social fact into art, history into myth, because there it's safe and secure. And Williams lived his whole life with a sense of defeat and deflected that into art as well, like so many of his characters. What though was Williams' impact on the wider theatre? Uh, seismic. Very few of the writers who had dominated the interwar years returned to Broadway after the war, at least not with anything impressive. Eugene O'Neill aside. Robert Sherwood, Maxwell Anderson, Philip Barry, Clifford Odets, Leon Hillman, for the most part had run their course then suddenly came Miller and Williams, and there has seldom been a period like it. Ten years of The Glass Menagerie, All My Sons, Streetcar, Death of a Salesman, Cat in a Hot Tin Roof, The Crucible. What it must be to be there in that period. When Sam Shepard began to write, his first effort was, he confessed, an imitation of Tennessee Williams. It's hard to imagine Lanford Wilson without Tennessee Williams as a forebear. For Lanford Wilson, Street Key was a key text while he actually wrote the libretto for Lee Holby's opera version of Summer and Smoke in 1971. And he also collaborated with Tennessee Williams on The Migrants, presented on television's Playhouse 90 in 1974. Beth Henley has expressed her admiration for his work, as has Terence McNally, who wrote a biographical essay on him. McNally, in particular, has commented on the disregard into which Williams fell in the last years of his life. It's hard, um, McNally says, to recall that Cat on a Hot Tin Roof was considered shocking, or suddenly last summer, that homosexuality 
was ever acknowledged as a subject. People, he confessed, just weren't interested in his work anymore. Not interested in Tennessee Williams. I don't know how that can happen to an artist that's given so much. It's Terence McNally. Neil Simon admired him because he was a poet who was prepared to take chances with plays like Camino Real. Emily Mann has directed Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Tony Kushner has said, I've always loved Williams. I read as much of Williams as I could get my hands on. I love Night of the Iguana, and I've always felt that Orpheus Descending is a fascinating play, much more fascinating than the Broadway production directed by that Tory weasel Peter Hall which I thought was just awful. <laughs> Edward Albee has spoken of the influence of aspects of Suddenly Last Summer and on the zoo story and said that when Tennessee Williams was writing at his best, few people could equal him. Even when he was not, he was better than most. As to Arthur Miller, he said, uh, when Williams arrived at the end of the 40s, he brought his own distinctive personality onto the stage, and this, I think, was the shock he created in an audience accustomed to faceless realism. At the same time, he had a grasp of dramatic writing that was very rare among those, including Odette, who intended to make poetry in the theater. But Williams was no esthete, still Miller. He had begun as a writer in the midst of the Depression, and his work echoed an awareness of the social as well as the personal elements affecting his themes and stories. His people were both alive and shadows on the larger wall. His work had a touch of the unique, the instinctive, the unexpected. In short, the surprise of reality as only the po poetic can reveal it. And his audience knew. That's from Arthur Miller. And what of that country which produced that Tory weasel, Peter Hall, Britain? The fact is that O'Neill, Miller and Williams electrified the British theatre. They did so in part because they took as their subject people taken from all areas and classes of life without reading them through the prism of class politics alone. They were, in short, that word which Americans with their support of dubious regimes abroad and hanging chads at home tend to overuse, democratic. And they acknowledged a dimension of life so often absent from the British stage and to some, as some suspect from British life, sexuality. As you are probably aware, the British tend to think of sex as a cross between duty and the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> it used to be said that a British woman's only recourse during sex was to lie back and think of England. Uh, an injunction which is today liable to be rather detumescent. But now suddenly with Tennessee Williams came a drama in which sexuality was deeply ingrained. You couldn't take it out of the play. It was the play. It was a part of the play. And there was in the plays the threat of impending violence. Of the gentleman caller, which became the glass menagerie, Williams himself regretfully said, it lacks the violence that so excites me. That was his comment on the glass menagerie. Lorca, of course, had written of sex and violence, but he was Spanish and so didn't count. <laughs> uh, European foreigners, as the British know, behave in ways best not talked about in polite society. <laughs> A View from the Bridge was banned from the public stage in Britain on the grounds that two men kiss one another in it, something we know not to occur unless you're Russian. And we waited in Britain for the latest play or film by Tennessee Williams, whose character spoke in a language we had never heard before and dealt with sexual passion, a concept, sexual passion, which didn't arrive in Britain until 1963. <laughs> As one of our poets, Philip Larkin, said in a poem, sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. <laughs> in Tennessee Williams' plays, sex meant consolation, danger, quite possibly destruction. But it existed, as did violence. In British plays, especially if you're Grant T.S. Eliot as British, which he was, really, 
People might die in Canterbury Cathedral at the behest of Henry VIII. In Tennessee Williams' plays, they were emasculated, tortured with blow torches, eaten alive. You didn't get that in Britain. <laughs> Suddenly, British drama changed its landscape, its characters, its values, even its audiences. To be sure, Britain itself was changing, but Tennessee Williams was an agent of transformation. Not because British playwrights began to set their plays in the deep south or featured men in torn shirts throwing a package of bleeding meat to their wives. <laughs> meat was still quite expensive in Britain at the time. But because passion and poetry were legitimised and not the poetry of Eliot and Christopher Fry. It's true that Terence Rattigan and Noel Coward, uh, both homosexual, had written heavily coded works, but he was another kind of theatre. Censorship in Britain only ended in 1968, but meanwhile here was a drama which acknowledged no constraints. For those in the gay community, as oppressed in Britain at the time as in America, there was another meaning. But for everyone, it was a drama that exuded excitement. People waited for the new Tennessee Williams as today children wait for the new Harry Potter, if for rather different reasons. <laughs> a middle-class theatre in which middle-class audiences watch middle-class actors playing out middle-class dilemmas suddenly became a place of excitement. And what can we ask of theatre but excitement, poetry, truth, in all of which Tennessee Williams specialised. But Britain did perform its familiar role in rescuing American playwrights from a native disregard. Vanessa Redgrave persuaded Britain's National Theatre to stage Tennessee's 30s play, Not About Nightingale, not the first time Europeans have come to the aid of the American theatre. You'll recall that O'Neill uh, left his last plays, I was talking about this on the radio uh, the other day, to Sweden because uh, he thought they were too depressing for American audiences, and as I said, I think he assumed that the Swedes were already depressed, so it <laughs> made no difference. Arthur Miller, Edward Albee, David Mamet would all choose to open their plays in England where they thought they would have a more sympathetic audience. It's true that Cat on a Hot Tin Roof rang on Broadway last year, directed, as it happens, by a British director, Anthony Page, but it played to only 52% capacity, perhaps because the cheapest seat was $66. Critics thought that the production lacked a smouldering sexuality. But in a society which produced sex and the city and six feet under, in which morticians mix sex with mortuary science, a play in which two people fail to have sex perhaps seemed too tame. Richard Eyre, a recent director of Britain's National Theatre, has said, as Tennessee Williams' reputation began to decline in America, his international reputation rose and nowhere more than in Britain. This is partly because our theatre, sustained as it is by subsidy, generally feels confident about its present, hopeful of its future, and conscious of its past, whereas American theatre has been robbed of continuity. And it's partly that the British, fed on Shakespeare, have an appetite for writing which uses such sinewy and passionate language with such unembarrassed enthusiasm. And someone was asking earlier what Miller's response was to Streetcar. He was electrified. He said, he sat in the audience and he said if he'd not seen that, he wouldn't have been able to write Death of a Salesman. It used a language which legitimized his poetic use of language. Tennessee Williams was in some ways always an outsider. His values were not those of a society on the make, leaning into the future, pursuing happiness. Like O'Neill and Miller, he had a tragic sense of life in a culture with a cheerable brother's sensibility. He celebrated those who found themselves on the edge. And of course, his sexuality was not that sanctioned by the state. He wrote a poem for Paul Bigelow, which can in some ways stand as his own epitaph. I think the strange, the crazed, the queer will have their holiday this year. I think for just a little while, there will be pity for the wild. I think in places known as gay, in secret clubs and private bars, the damned will serenade the damned with frantic drums and wild guitars. I think for some uncertain reason, mercy will be shown this season to the lonely and misfit, to the brilliant and deformed, 
I think they will be housed and warmed and fed and comforted for a while before, with such a tender smile, the earth destroys her crooked child. Tennessee Williams was not a crooked child, but he came close to being destroyed by his own personal demons, to be sure, but also by the disregard with which his own country came to treat his work in the last 25 years of his life. But the truth is that there has never been a writer quite like him. From his earliest works to the last plays, he was a poet who chose the theatre as his arena for poetry. He captured the evanescence of life which he held like a moth in his hand. Was he a radical? Not in the sense that he had visions of a socialist utopia. Not in that he thought the theatre an aspect of political transformation. He was a radical in a more fundamental sense than that. He wished to celebrate those who lived their lives at a tangent to a society on the make. He saw art as itself the source of alternative values, as a consolation to be sure, but also as a challenge to those for whom meaning was taken to reside in ambition, power, money. Tennessee Williams ended, Arthur Miller remarked, quote, as he had begun, on the outside, looking in, as he once put it, scratching on the glass. Tennessee Williams was the bird who lived on the wing and finally came to earth on February the 25th, 1983, at the Elysee Hotel in New York. He died alone. But the voices he heard, we hear still. The voices of Amanda Wingfield, of Tom and his damaged sister Laura, of Stanley Kowalski and Blanche Dubois, of Maggie the Cat, and even now Fern and Star in Candles to the Sun. Theatre operates in the present tense, and the present tense is our tense. In one of his plays, a woman has her virginity restored with every full moon. It's a good trick if you can pull it off. <laughs> but that is essentially how the theatre operates. It is always the first time, and for as long as the theatre exists, a woman dressed in a white suit and wearing white gloves will come round the corner for the first time, carrying a valise and say, they told me to take a streetcar named Desire. Thank you. So the true radical has to die. And Williams, and I agree with you, was the true radical. So my question though is, is there supposed to be a letter by O'Neill written to Williams when O'Neill was undergoing Parkinson's symptoms? No one seems to know what's in that letter. Do you know anything? A letter from O'Neill to Williams or from Williams to O'Neill? It is a letter from Eugene O'Neill written to Williams when O'Neill was presumably having Parkinson's symptoms. No, I, uh, I, I don't, but there is a, there's a curious contradiction in that because when he developed that, it took him 15 minutes to write his own name. Uh, so he must have been, if he wrote such a letter, it must have been in the very first onset of it. 
I mean, one of the great tragedies uh, of O'Neill uh, was that his, his brain was perfectly all right. He couldn't write. He tried tape recording, and he said it was like listening to his own ghosts. Uh, so the, can you imagine anything worse than a writer who physically can't write but can go on imagining that world? But I don't know the answer to your question. As to uh, Gore Vidal, they were... Uh, very close um, for obvious reasons. They shared, a, in many ways, a sensibility. Uh, there is a more articulate spitefulness from Gore Vidal uh, than Tennessee Williams usually devoted himself to. Uh, Vidal was much more of a public figure. After all, he ran for public office in this country, uh, which Tennessee Williams would never have thought of doing. Uh, there was a privacy to, to Tennessee Williams. He kept himself to himself. He tried to avoid danger. And I think even in those... I was talking about the, the letter in support of Arthur Miller when, um, when his passport was withdrawn. He was supposed to go to Belgium for the European premiere of The Crucible. And as though to prove the truth of The Crucible, they took his passport away uh, so he couldn't go. Well, he did write a letter, uh, but when... Uh, Miller tried to enrol his, his support publicly over things. He tended to be rather diffident about that. There hasn't ever been anything diffident about Gore Vidal. I must say there's one thing about Gore Vidal I find amazing. I, I run a writer's series and I bought Gore Vidal there. This sounds like gossip. It's, well, it is. Um, <laughs> when he'd finished, he gave a wonderful Gore Vidal performance and we went to a restaurant. And I said, would you like a drink? And he said, I'll have a scotch. And the guy brought a bottle and poured a measure of scotch, whereupon Gore Vidal's hand closed over the wrist, turned it so that the bottle was set down on the table. And in the course of a dinner, he drank an entire bottle of whiskey. That should kill you. <laughs> I mean, this man is tough. And uh, I, I, he's looking very frail at the moment. He's reduced to a pale shadow at the moment, which is which is distressing. But I'm a great admirer of Gore Vidal. Uh, actually, of the, of the very things that are despised, I like the history. I like the novels which engage history. Uh, the more fashionable thing is, is to like Myra Breckenridge and the more fanciful, whimsical ones. Um, yeah, he too is a radical dissenter with America, but he took it to the position of actually running for public office, as he would because he came from a line of politicians, the Vidals. It's not an answer, I'm just circling around <laughs> the question. And when they opened up Williams, he literally cried. Is that right? According to Gore. <laughs> <laughs> With a little Chianti? No, no. <laughs> uh. Other questions? Very good. Thank you very much.